This, this is Sirius XM Doctor Radio. Direct from the NYU Langone Medical Center, here is Dr. Nisa Goldberg. Welcome to Beyond the Heart. I'm your host, Dr. Nisa Goldberg, and coming up in today's show, how psychiatric nurses are working to meet the growing need for mental health help. Here, a forensic nurse shared the surprising findings when researchers looked at the autopsies of people who died prematurely. And I'll be on call for you in our Ask Dr. Nisa segment. But first, what women need to know about their eye health. And joining me by phone for this discussion is Dr. Susan Weinstein. She's a low vision optometrist. Welcome to the show, Susan. Hi, thank you for having me. First off, what is a low vision optometrist? Uh, A low vision optometrist is an optometrist that specializes in helping patients that are visually impaired um, maximize the vision that they have and maintain their independence um, even though they have an eye condition or an eye disease that's causing their vision to be um, subnormal. Okay, and and, you know, to start off, do you think people um, take their eyes for granted and don't even get them checked? Uh, Definitely. Especially people that don't need glasses. People that wear glasses tend to come more frequently because they want to make sure that their prescription is updated. But patients that don't need to wear glasses definitely can go years without having their eyes checked, which is not a good idea. So how often should we get our eyes checked? Um, You know, it really depends on the patient. Um, I would say that as a general rule for somebody that's young and healthy, um, every year or two is probably okay. Um, But if somebody has a family history of any eye disease or a patient has any medical issues like diabetes, then they may have to have their eyes checked more frequently. So can you tell, can you go through a typical eye exam, what you do when when a person comes in for an eye consultation? Uh, Well, we always start out with a history. Um, So we get a medical history to find out if there are any medical issues that could affect the eyes. Uh, We also ask about family history because there are eye diseases that can run in the family. Um, As a low vision up top. What what diseases tend to run in families? uh, Glaucoma can run in the family. Macular degeneration can run in the family. Okay. Um, and then, a, and at a, pace, a place like Lighthouse Guild, where I work as a low vision optometrist, then we would also ask, do more of a functional history, where we would um, try to ascertain what kind of problems the patient is having because of the vision loss. Um, so we might ask them if they're working, if they want to be able to work, if they, you know, had to stop working because of the vision loss, um, if they're having trouble in the home taking care of basic activities of daily living, like making meals for themselves, uh, grooming sure. themselves, things like that. Okay, and and then you you know you do the eye exam. Right. So take us through the eye exam. Um, so you know there are multiple multiple steps along the way. Um, we check visual acuity, which is um, seeing whether the, you know what the patient can read on the eye chart, um, and um, we check if the eyes are working well together properly. Um, we check for a pupil response. We check uh, do a gross examination of the peripheral vision. Uh, we check the eyes under a slit lamp, which is basically like a microscope that lets us get a, a deeper, better look at the structure, wow. structures of the eye. And, do you, um, and do you, you know, a lot of times when people um, see the, uh, go, go to have their eyes checked, they have to have their pupils dilated. Is that important? Yes. And why do we do that? Yes, that is important. Um, we do that because... Um, the doctor can get a much better look inside the eye if the pupils are dilated. Um, the doctor shines a light into the eye and the pupils normally react to light by closing and then the doctor can't get a, a good look deep inside the back of the eye at the retina and at the optic nerve if the pupils are closing. So by dilating the pupils, um, the pupils don't react and they stay nice and wide open for the doctor. So you to have to a better a window into the eye, right? Exactly, yeah. So um, for our listeners who are just joining us, we're talking about women and eye health with Dr. Susan Weinstein. She's a low vision optometrist, and we're going to be talking about eye diseases common in women. And if you have any questions about 
cataracts, macular degeneration, and glaucoma, you can give us a call at 877-NYU-DOCS. That's 877-698-3627. Or you can email us at docs at SiriusXM.com. So let's talk, Susan, let's talk about the eye diseases that are more common in women and try to understand why they seem to be more common in women. Uh, well, actually, um, most of the, um, the the most most well known or most commonly found eye diseases are more common in women. Um, things like macular degeneration, cataracts, and glaucoma are actually all found more commonly in women. Um, it's hard to know exactly why um, women do tend to live longer, and these right. conditions, you know, progress as people get older. Um, women do tend to go to uh, doctors more often, so they may be picked up more. They picked up more frequently, frequently sure. Right. Um, women have hormone, hormonal changes um, to the course of life that can affect the eyes. Um, there are also um, autoimmune diseases that tend to affect women more, and that can affect the eyes. So, in general, women are affected. Uh, more by eye disease um, than men. So let's talk about some of these common eye diseases we've brought up, like glaucoma. What is it and, you know, what are its implications for your eye health and how do we treat it? Uh, so glaucoma is basically when there's an increase in pressure inside the eye, um, either because there's too much fluid being produced in the eye or because the fluid is not draining out properly. Um, and it can actually have very serious implications. Um, if it's not treated, a person can go blind from glaucoma. And um, it's really important, you know, that's an example where it shows why it's important to have routine eye exams. Right, so they can for, measure the pressure, right? Right, even for a person who doesn't need glasses and doesn't wear glasses, they may have pressure building up in the eye that they don't feel. Typically, if the pressure um, is very high, it can cause pain, but at the levels that it can start causing glaucoma. It wouldn't necessarily cause any pain to the patient. So that's an example of where it would be important to have the eyes checked to check the pressure and make sure that it's at a normal level. Um, and if, it, if it's not at a normal level um, and the patient is diagnosed with, with glaucoma, then usually the first line of treatment would be eye medication to lower the pressure in the eye. Okay, and um, we have someone re wanting to ask you a question, Susan. We're going to welcome Angela from Illinois. Hi, Angela. How can we help you? How are you today? I'm good. Um, so I'm 54 years old. I've never worn glasses. Um, I've always had a, a little bit of an issue with my left eye just being a little weaker than my right eye. Mm -hmm. In January, I got the shingles virus in my nasal cavity and behind my eye. Mm -hmm. It was a mild case, but I still had it. Mm -hmm. After that started to clear up on my left, or I'm sorry, on my left side, I had the shingles. On my right side, I mm -hmm. received a bump on my eye, which turned into a chalazion. Mm -hmm. And I had that removed, and about five days later, I got another one on mm -hmm. my eye. So mm -hmm. then I had that removed. Mm -hmm. And ever since that, I've lost my vision in my right eye. It, everything is very blurry. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, I'm doing a, I pulled off the side of the road to call. I traveled two hours to get to a university today and just battling to see where I'm going. So mm -hmm. I know I need to buckle down and get some sort of glasses, but I've mm -hmm. been to the ophthalmologist and they've given me a script now. Mm -hmm. They can't explain to me why. My eye was perfectly fine until this chalazion. Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, Susan, can you ta explain what a chalazion is? Um, yeah, I mean, a, a chalazion is when there's um, granulomatous material that um, accumulates in the eye and sort of leaves like a bump or um, an elevated lesion um, on the eyelid. Um, it's not infectious, but it's... It can be annoying and it can also bother people cosmetically. Um, and as Angela mentioned, you know, usually usually they have to be removed. I mean, sometimes patients can try hot compresses to get rid of them, but uh -huh. but oftentimes they have to be removed surgically. Um, so, I mean, it sounds like there were a lot of things going on, you know, with your eye and sure. um, shingles, you know, which is from, you know, the her herpes zoster can affect the eye in many, many ways. So, um you know, without knowing all the details, it would be hard to really comment, but it sounds like you should definitely, you know, continue to follow up with your eye doctor closely and um, try the prescription that they gave you, and hopefully it'll help. 
um, if, if it doesn't help, then that's a situation where you might want to go to a low vision specialist who might be able to describe other types of, you know, special glasses um, or other devices that might help you see better. Okay, thanks for calling in, Angela. And for those of you who are just joining us, I'm on the phone with Dr. Susan Weinstein. She's a low vision optometrist, and we're talking about women and eye health. And we've opened up the phones to take your questions so you can join our conversation at 877-NYU-DOCS. That's 877 698 Three six two seven, or you can email us at docs at siriusxm.com. Susan, um, you know, to go back to the discussion we had on glaucoma, is there any way that we can prevent glaucoma? Like if you have a family history, what, you know, can the offspring, you know, take steps to prevent to help protect their vision? Uh, I mean, I would say that the main thing would really be to have your eyes checked early and regularly so that way if there's any changes that are developing that can be detected early because if it's caught early it can be treated and you can prevent damage to the optic nerve but if it's caught late then uh, once the damage is done to the optic nerve it's um, you know it's, not, it's hard to go back right and you know we have an email from Linda Linda writes I'm a 45 year old woman with mild astigmatism no contacts I never had my eyes dilated Mm -hmm. Is that a problem? What's the point of dilatation? Um, you know, so again, it, it's possible that, that there are no conditions to be concerned about, but at the same time, um, you know, as I said before, the doctor can get a much better look inside the back of the eye to make sure that there's nothing subtle developing that might not be picked up with a, right. uh, a root, you know, an undilated exam. There are certain situations where doing a dilation might not be a good idea for a patient. I don't know if certain structures in their eye are very narrow, and, and um, but that's something that the doctor would look at before they dilate to make sure that that you know, there would be no, you know, no contraindication to doing the dilation. And can you explain the mild astigmatism? What is an astigmatism? Um, and astigmatism is basically where the, the shape of the eye and, and the cornea, um, instead of it being a nice round sphere, is shaped more cylindrically or like a football. And um, the prescription ends up being a little bit different than a standard spherical nearsighted or farsighted prescription. So I, the term makes people nervous, but it's actually just right. a variation on the type of, of glasses prescription that somebody would be wearing. Okay. Thanks for clearing that up. I know that people get that. They, they're they probably told that by their optometrist or ophthalmologist, and, and they're a little bit scared or right. don't understand. So that's great. We're going to welcome Sheila from Georgia. Hi, Sheila. How can we help you? Hi. Hi. I wanted to ask um, first about, I developed cataracts very young for some, I'm 56 years old now. I actually had cataracts in both eyes removed when I was only 30 years old. Mm -hmm. I've had um, very poor vision. When I had the cataracts removed, I was legally blind. Mm -hmm. um, I've since that time I've had uh, laser surgeries, the PRKs, whatever would come out to help my vision. Mm -hmm. Now I'm going through um, like a cornea. The, they say I may have to have a cornea transplant, mm -hmm. and I'm also worried about my dad has macular degeneration. Mm -hmm. With him having it, would the chances of me getting it be much higher? Um, so macular degeneration can run in the family. Okay. Um, um, there, are, there is actually genetic testing available um, to see whether or not you have the gene for it. So if it's something that's you know on your mind, you might want to consider doing that. Um, you know, I, I would say that if it runs in the family and you have a lot of other eye issues going on, there are certain preventative measures that you can take to try to keep your eyes as healthy as possible. Um, and that would be um, if you smoke, try to quit. Um, wear sunglasses with UV ultraviolet protection when you're outside and um, have a healthy diet and perhaps consider taking a nutritional supplement that's um, recommended for patients that have macular degeneration. You know, and that's something that I would suggest that you speak with your primary care physician and also your eye doctor about. 
Okay. Thanks for calling in, Sheila. We're going to welcome Janice from Georgia. Hi, Janice. How can we help you? Hi. Um, I had um, cataract surgery, and then I also had um, some problems with the retina, like a wrinkle in my retina, which they said they corrected. Mm -hmm. I had surgery on that. Um, but now, I mean, it's been about a year and a half. I get extremely bloodshot eye in one eye to the point where it, it's kind of scary to people who see it. It's not mm -hmm. like it's just red. It looks like there's like a, just half of my eye just turns bright red and it almost looks like it's blistered, but it's not. I mean, I don't even feel it, mm -hmm. but it's, it's very visible, and I've had it checked by uh, three or four doctors. They all say it's due to dry eye, so they put the little uh, tubes in the corners of my eye to drain it better, mm -hmm. but I still get it. I get it like if I, I'm a tennis player. I play tennis. I, after a tennis match, my eye just turns bright red. Mm -hmm. It doesn't go into the pupil. It's just um, in the white of my eye. So I was wondering if you had any insight into something like that because I can't seem to get an answer. <laughs> um, well, Dr. Susan Weinstein, <laughs> you have an answer for that. <laughs> um, I mean, it, you know, if if the diagnosis was, was dry eye and that's why they gave you those punctal plugs, the little, you know, plugs to uh, prevent the tears from draining out, um, I mean, I would say that you should talk to your doctor about whether taking any eye medication would help because for dry eye, there are lots of different types of medication, some are over the counter, some are prescription, and maybe that could reduce you know, your symptoms and um, make you feel better and also make your eyes look better. I do them four times a day um, you know, for the dry eye, and uh, I'm also still on a steroid and a, um, something for the pressure from the surgery, the retina surgery that I had. I mean, I, I guess I'll be on that forever, but, you know, I, I think I'm doing everything. I'm, I mean, can you think of anything else? Um, th there, there have been some, some studies also that have shown that omega-3 fish oil is good for dry eye. Um, if in general, the environment that you're in is very dry, um, that might be something to avoid. Um, make sure that you're hydrated well. And um, there's also a uh, relatively new treatment, which, you know, again, I don't know if this is something that you're a candidate for, but it's something that you could speak with your doctor about, um, where there's an, um, an amniotic tissue membrane. It's um, part of the placenta, um, the tissue um, closest to the baby during development that has healing properties, um, has actually been formulated into what looks like a very large contact lens and can be put onto a patient's eye who has extreme dry eye or other types of corneal or, you know, the diseases on the front surface of the eye. So again, I don't know that you'd be a candidate for it, but, you know, that is something that when a lot of other things are not working could be um, an option for a patient. Okay, Janice, does that answer your question? Well, I just, I just one less, like you would agree then that it is the dry eyes, I mean, you can't think I of can, anything yeah. else. I can, mean, yeah. Without, she can't without really examining exa you, I without, can't really diagnose you, you know, without looking, you know, without seeing your eyes and doing an exam, um, you know, but um, if that's been the diagnosis that you were given by three doctors, um, you know, hopefully that's the diagnosis. If you're not sure that that's really the right diagnosis, then you might want to, you know, get another opinion, but it's hard for me to, you know, tell you over the phone. Okay. Okay. Well, thank thanks you. for calling in, Janice. For those of you who are just joining us, I'm on the phone with Dr. Susan Weinstein. She's a low vision optometrist affiliated with Lighthouse um, here in, in New York City. And we're taking your calls about eye health in women. And it's 877 NYU Docs. That's 877 6983627. Or you can email us at docs at SiriusXM.com. We're going to welcome Janet from Louisiana. Hi, Janet. How can we help you? Hi. Thank you for taking my call. Sure. Um, a little history. My mom is, uh, well, she'll be 79 next month, and she was diagnosed with macular degeneration over a year ago, the wet kind. 
Mm-hmm. And I will be 59 next month. And um, I do wear glasses. I've worn them for a lot of years. And, and did mention this to my doctor um, when I went to get, you know, my last appointment. So she put me on the preservation or suggested that I take, wait, is it, yeah, preservation. Mm-hmm. Um, I supplement. And she also gave me this little chart mm-hmm. with this little black dot mm-hmm. um, to, you know, do that every once in a while and what I don't recall she had mentioned doing some sort of a baseline test which she wanted me to call my insurance company and see if it was covered mm-hmm. and which I never did uh, mm-hmm. but um, if if um, you mentioned the test for the right. genetic mm-hmm. so, so do you know is that generally covered by insurance and if you do catch macular degeneration you know early mm-hmm. Is it treatable? Is it is it curable? Um, so she's at the point where you know she gets shots every right. three months right. in her eyes. So um, while we're on the topic of macular degeneration, Susan, can you just explain what it is and then try to answer that question? Okay. Um, yeah, so there are two, there are basically two forms of macular degeneration. Um, there's the dry type and the wet type. Um, with the dry type, there are deposits that develop um, under the retina and they develop in the macula, which is the part of the eye that um, is responsible for our central vision and for fine detail, you know, for letting us see you know, straight ahead, fine detail, um, how we're, fun- you know, the vision that we need to function, you know, in day-to-day activities. Um, in the wet macular degeneration, there are new blood vessels that grow in that area and they leak blood and fluid into the eye and um, that also causes damage to the vision. So with with the dry type of macular degeneration, um, the treatment, so to speak, is really more preventative um, it's um, modification of risk factors. So as I mentioned before, um, no smoking, have a healthy diet, um, vitamin supplements, um, UV protection, wearing sunglasses when you're outside because the rays of the sun can be damaging. Um, there, are some, there are some studies that are showing now also that the blue light that's emitted from all the um, devices that we're now using all day long, like cell phones and tablets and computers, can right? also be damaging to the macula. So there really? Are certain types Why is of, that, Susan? Um, because those, the, uh, the blue light, um, the short wavelength lights um, are damaging to the macula and the, there are certain pigments inside the eye that help absorb that and as we get older um, some of those pigments are less and we're less protected from you know those damaging blue lights but there are some types of um, filters um, on, in glasses or on computer screens that can okay. be made to help prevent some of that blue light from entering. Um, so you know those are all things that can be done to help prevent the uh, macular degeneration um, from progressing um, with with the wet type of macular degeneration, as um, Janet mentioned, the um, injections in the eye are what prevent the vision from getting worse because it helps prevent the development of the the, uh, new blood vessels and and the leakage. Um, So it's hard to really predict um, if somebody's going to get it. but doing these things are definitely um, preventative and can help prevent the disease from progressing. Okay, well, thanks for calling in with your question, Janet. And we're going to move on to Mary from Connecticut. Hi, Mary, how can we help you? Hi, thank you. Um, I wanted to ask a question because um, I'm not sure when to start to be concerned about this, but every time I go to the eye doctor, they do with the technician in the machine a test for the eye pressure Mm -hmm. and it's always high Mm -hmm. and then the regular the doctor eye doctor checks it again he gets a lower number and he says oh okay it's all right Mm -hmm. we'll just continue to watch it Mm -hmm. so i'm i'm just concerned like should i start to go to an eye specialist to more fully evaluate um it was like 15 to 17 now it's like 20 to 22 when i go in is there some magic number that is a screening threshold that you should um, start to be more concerned? Well, uh, I mean, normal pressure is anywhere from about 8 to 21, 22. Um, different, different machines that we use, different instruments that we use to test the pressure can come up with, with slightly different variations. So the air puff, which is what it sounds like you had you know, done initially by the technician, 
um, does tend to give a higher reading than other techniques that are used. And when the doctor took you in later, he may have done another technique. Um, did, he, did he put a drop in your eye with the blue light? Um, that's often yeah, exactly. that's often what's on right. So that test is a little bit more accurate and um, would give a more accurate reading of the pressure. Um, so, but I would also ask. You know, you can also ask the doctor whether there are other signs in the eye. How does your optic nerve look? Because if there is glaucoma developing, um, that will affect the optic nerve. Um, although it's not, you know, the, the, we don't always see signs in the eye in very, very early signs of the, of the disease, but there are other tests that can be done to see whether or not um, the optic nerve is healthy um, and whether there's any changes in the optic nerve even in the very early stages of the condition. Okay, great. Okay, thanks for calling in, Mary. We're going to welcome Tracy from Arizona. Hi, Tracy. How can we help you? Hi, thank you guys for taking my call. Sure. I was calling because I have a six year old granddaughter who seems to get a sty in the same place. Um, it's a recurring sty. And I wondered if there, if I should, you know, what I could tell her mom maybe that could help that. Um, it seems to last for like a week or so. And I wondered if you had any ideas. Should I be doing moist heat or, or having um, just wondered what you thought about that? So, Susan, can you talk about what a sty is and why they occur? Yeah, um, it's basically an infection inside uh, the gland uh, that helps produce uh, some of the tears. Um, if, it's, if it's recurring, then it's probably due to an underlying condition. Um, she may have blepharitis, which is an eyelid inflammation uh, where the glands that help produce the tears get clogged up. Um, so I, I don't know, it, I wasn't, it wasn't clear if she's seen an eye doctor at this point, but if it's been coming back multiple times, I would say that she should have her eyes checked by an eye doctor to make sure that it's not, you know, some underlying condition that's causing it that might need treatment. And, um, you know, just to make sure that there's nothing, you know, more serious going on, especially if it's coming back in exactly the same spot each time. Uh, generally speaking, yes, if it is a sty, um, hot compresses is, is one of the things that's recommended, but sometimes um, antibiotics need to be recommended as well. Okay, so that's someone you should go see your eye doctor. Yes. Okay, I will okay. tell her. Thank you so much. Thanks. And, and Dr. Susan Weinstein, we have an email from Mike. Mike writes, my two-year-old granddaughter has been diagnosed with congenital albinism of the eye. What mm -hmm. should we be concerned about? Can you explain um, that? Yeah, so, um, you know, just like um, a, somebody can have albinism where um, the, their skin and their hair has less pigment yes. than normal, um, that can affect the eye also. So there are some patients um, that it, where it only affects the eye um, and the pigment in the eye is reduced. So um, I would definitely say that um, she should make sure that she's wearing um, sunwear with UV protection, UVA and UVB protection because she has less pigment in her eye and the pigment helps protect us from the damaging rays of the sun. Um, and, you know, it depends also on what her visual acuity is. Um, if, if the albinism in the eye has affected her vision, then, um, again, you may want to seek um, help from a low vision specialist because okay, if regular glasses doesn't good. help then others might. That's good advice. So I, before we go, I thought you'd talk a little bit about the Lighthouse Guild, where you work. Yeah, so the Lighthouse Guild is um, a leading organization um, dedicated to helping patients who are blind and visually impaired maintain their independence. And um, we use a multidisciplinary approach. Um, we have low vision specialists. We have orientation and mobility instruction, activities of daily living training, uh, mental health services, nutrition. Um, that we have an adult day program, and you know all, all the providers that are here um, have a sensitivity to people who are blind and visually impaired, and try to help them function, you know, as independently and, and productively as possible. And how can people find out about getting an appointment or this and more about the services? Um, the number to make an appointment here is 212-769-6313. Uh, okay. Um, and also, um, you have a website? Yes. 
okay. um, lighthouseguild.org. Okay, so I think this is important because you, you you, your, your organization and you do excellent work and these are important resources that individuals might not know about. Right. And I, I want to thank you for joining us today, Susan. Um, it's always great to have you on. Thank you so much for having me and thank you for your show. Thank you.